All right, I think we're back, Ray, is that right? Yes, we are back on stage. We are live. Um, so thank you for coming back from the break. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our keynote speakers for uh, this afternoon, or depending on what time you are, or whatever time period you're looking at. Um, our speakers this afternoon um, are Roba Abbas and uh, Katina Michael. Uh, Dr. Abbas is a lecturer and academic program director with the Faculty of Business and Law at the University of Wollongong in Australia. Her background is in location-based service regulation, and her current research interests include methodological approaches to complex socio-technical system design. Uh, she is the co-editor of the IEEE Transactions on Technology and Society, uh, and prior to her current position was a product manager at Internet Trek. Dr. Michael is a professor in the School of the Future of Innovation in Society in the School of Computing in the Augmented Intelligence at, excuse me, Augment, uh, at Arizona State University. Uh, her research is predominantly in the areas of emerging technologies with secondary interests in technology used for national security and their corresponding social implications. Uh, she's the founding editor-in-chief of IEEE Transactions on Technology in Society. And prior to her current position, she worked for a range of industry and uh, leading technology companies. So we are very lucky to have these speakers. Um, I'm excited that we actually have two speakers uh, giving a, a joint keynote here, and um, I would welcome them to present their work. Uh, I would also say that uh, the speakers are actually gonna take the, the hour for, to do the keynote address. So if there's any questions, we'll try and address those in the breakout rooms or the tables at the end of this talk. Um, but I'll let you take it away and hand over the stage. Thanks very much. Thank you, Rui, and the team for the introduction and the invitation to speak, um, and also to the organizers of this event for an impressive program. Uh, Professor Katina Michael and I are delighted to be here today at the second Spatial Data Science Symposium, where we'll deliver a talk on uh, geospatial big data analytics, focusing on the opportunities and challenges in both present and future modes of operation. Uh, but before I, uh, we begin, Katina and I are joining on the next slide, please, Katina, are joining from the state of New South Wales in Australia. And as such, we would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land upon which we meet virtually today and pay our respects to their elders past and present. Uh, as part of this presentation on the next slide, we'll be providing background for our joint research into location services and geospatial systems, briefly highlighting some of our past projects, our current research focus, and our research trajectory as it relates to geospatial big data analytics and the geospatial AI or artificial intelligence revolution. Our focus will be on highlighting the foundational concepts, pointing to the challenges and uh, opportunities, in addition to the implications in those present and future modes of operations through uh, a series of case studies, predominantly from an information systems and engineering perspective. And we'll conclude the presentation by reviewing select implications and proposing some design recommendations based on our research. So on the following slide, just by way of background, uh, this slide illustrates our research timeline with respect to location services and geospatial systems. The timeline only represents our joint work, which really began in 2005, 2006, in the context of cybersecurity and risk management research concerning public sector information availability and critical infrastructure protection, in addition to Katina's involvement early on in an IP location services program at the time, which also in, involved um, or informed our work in the location-based services field. Now, between 2005 and 2010, we were preparing uh, research projects that were broadly about the social and regulatory implications of emerging technologies. And in 2009 and 2010, we conducted a large scale so, so technical consultation in Australia. And the intention here was to establish whether there was a need or the need to regulate the location-based services industry. And around this time, we were also researching location-based social networking applications, the Internet of Things, and a range of other emerging technologies. And this led to the development of several frameworks, specifically socio-ethical and regulatory frameworks that allowed us to better understand the nature of advanced location-based services, which I'll speak about in a moment, but also allowed us to derive theoretical and methodological insights about 
the manner in which socio-technical systems operate. This included an increased appreciation for the role of multi and interdisciplinarity, in addition to stakeholder engagement in the design of location services and other emerging technologies more broadly. And since 2015, we've moved towards the study of location-based care platforms, uh, conducting research into contact tracing and tr tracking applications and other technological measures that were introduced in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, for example, and we're currently exploring location-based artificial intelligence. In terms of our future research program, we will seek to develop transdisciplinary approaches to socio-technical systems design, where we will look beyond that multi and interdisciplinary lens and approaches that we had previously employed in past projects to the design of location-based and other systems that are in the public interest and that emphasize care. And this will require research into enhanced regulatory frameworks and other areas which are beyond the scope of this presentation. So on the next slide, in terms of building on this background, our initial work and experience as a team into location services, location intelligence and geospatial systems, which was largely in the form of technical industry-based experience that was engineering focus. So this was an organizational perspective at the time. Um, uh, and was very much around location-based or location intelligence activities that were inter-organisational in nature, relying on increased digitisation and desktop digital mapping capabilities, which utilised um, uh, data sets that were purchased and they were often expensive and required extensive cleaning before they could be used for location intelligence on behalf of organisational clients. The digitisation aspect, he saw the transition to global digital mapping with location data, leading to location intelligence capabilities, which I'll get to in a moment. On the next slide, um, we demonstrate a transition in our research into location services and geospatial systems, where our initial projects, specifically our Australian Research Council funded project on location services regulation, uh, intended to move beyond that industry or inter-organisational perspective to encompass and investigate location services and location intelligence as it applies to academia, but also as it applies to the public and private sectors. And this work clearly highlighted that the move from organizations being in command of location data and location intelligence capabilities to geospatial data being made available uh, by the public sector for agency and consumer uh, use. Uh, and that sort of emerging from that is the idea or the introduction of commercial location-based services that enabled consumers to independently gather, store and analyze location data for intelligence and other use cases. And during our research, I think it became uh, evident early on that to study the opportunities and challenges associated with location services and geospatial systems, and to inform specifically the design of these systems, we would require more than that technical or domain specific perspective. So for example, uh, more than a perspective led by industry given the potential of commercial location based services and also the varied organizational and government location services available and the diverse usability scenarios that we need to account for and accommodate in our design discussions. On this current slide, uh, what you see is a summary of a consultative socio-technical methodological process that we employed in our research to allow us to address a range of socio-ethical and socio-technical challenges that pertain to location-based services. And that was within the Australian context. And this research was against a backdrop whereby location-based services were being designed, developed, and deployed without explicit consideration of the implications for a range of stakeholders, namely consumers, organisational and government entities. Uh, for instance, uh, attention in industry at the time was generally on the technology and on improvements in location intelligence capabilities rather than the social or the regulatory aspects. The three phases on our study that are demonstrated here were geared toward addressing this evident gap by assessing aspects relevant to usability, evaluating the underlying location services value chain to represent stakeholder relationships and dynamics between the stakeholders. And also uh, we were looking to determine a way in which we could represent the socio-ethical dilemmas. And uh, we will present some of those as part of our case studies. And finally, we were also interested in examining 
the existing regulatory landscape and determining what changes or mechanisms would be necessary to address the socio-ethical challenges that emerged as a result of our study. And in fulfilling some of these aims or these evident gaps in, in scholarship, in the industry, our team engaged in several phases with location services stakeholders and they include in summary an observational study of users as part of phase one which is on the left hand side of your screen and as part of phases two and three we engage with operational and non-operational industry industry stakeholders and also government agencies here in Australia respectively. On the next slide, we can observe some of the social, technical and environmental considerations that emerged during the framing of our research. So for instance, to draw out a few examples, you've got social considerations, which were largely concerned with the ethical dilemmas and issues of control, including the various forms of valence, which Katina will discuss in more detail shortly. And also issues of trust, privacy and security were quite prevalent. Uh, technical themes and sub-themes of interest include the technological developments that influence location services or influencing location services, an understanding of location and positioning uh, infrastructures and the technological and marketing situation, including industry trends and predictions, among other themes. And lastly, environmental considerations were in reference to the regulatory environment in view of the public policy setting and existing legislation that applies to location services. These considerations demonstrate the importance of, within the context of this presentation, moving beyond a focus on the technical or the computational in view of location services and geospatial systems to a systems view where we consider the design of location services in general and the study of opportunities and challenges in particular in a more comprehensive fashion. And our team adopted an offshoot of systems theory, namely socio-technical or a socio-technical theoretical lens that allowed us to conceptualize these complex themes through the social, technical and environmental subsystems perspective. And then we were able to model and conceptualize dynamics in that way. Uh, on the next slide, as we can see, this included the ability to approach discussions around regulation, which was part of our core study, from a multi-stakeholder perspective, which is in, illustrated in that target audience column on the slide. And that is, we were able to explicitly account for government, industry and user groups, among other stakeholder types in regulatory discussions. And this is really important given the multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary requirement of the study. Now, without going into too much detail here, I might jump to the next slide to talk about some of the outcomes, uh, which were the result of the three phases of study. And as a result of these phases, we were able to draw out a range of socio-ethical challenges associated with location services and geospatial systems, in addition to regulatory requirements from the perspective of users, industry, and government stakeholders. So in summary here, uh, users, in particular advocated for a balance between the desirable and less desirable uses of location-based services when we were considering regulation, noting that our responsibility, or it is our responsibility, to acknowledge and accommodate the needs of vulnerable individuals in various usability contexts whilst also regulating specific instances of use, and these could be things such as emergency management or safety scenarios or use cases, for example. Industry stakeholders, on the other hand, were concerned with the actual regulatory frameworks themselves, and they called for a consistent or consistent frameworks across Australia, identifying consistencies across states as being quite problematic. They also flagged amendments to existing legislation in addition to other mechanisms such as codes, uh, standards and industry-based principles as being appropriate to regulatory discussions and to the emergence of a regulatory framework for location services. On the next slide, from a government perspective, the themes were largely consistent with those identified by users in the industry representatives. And um, we utilised and reconciled all these perspectives, these are divergent perspectives, to develop a regulatory framework for location services in Australia with elements of the framework applicable also to other emerging technologies beyond um, our context and uh, location-based services as a specific use case of technology. And while I won't provide a, a detailed overview here, uh, I've got some uh, references up on the slide and also on the following slide, I think I might move on to our current research focus, which was heavily informed by the outcome 
outcomes of the work that we just shared. And this includes from a theoretical, methodological and practical perspective, what we can contribute to the design of next generation technologies or next generation socio-technical systems. And we're presently considering in addition to advanced location services, um, as was the interest in previous research, big data analytics, specifically geospatial big data and related opportunities, challenges and design considerations. Up on this slide, in terms of providing an overview of our current our current research, we will first introduce some of the important terms that we'll then uh, build on as part of our case studies. The first is big data, which can be defined as large unstructured and, and structured data sets that are too large and complex for traditional processing. These data sets can be analysed to reveal insights, trends and patterns which can inform decision-making processes and improve business and other interactions. And this essentially defines uh, big data analytics as a field. Now we can extend this discussion for the purposes of this presentation to define geospatial big data uh, for the purposes of our discussion with an emphasis on geospatial um, data being valuable given that it's reported in literature that 80% of the uh, data that's generated or the big data that's generated daily is location aware or geospatial in nature and we feel that this is somewhat of a conservative uh, figure or estimate and slightly somewhere near 90 percent of the big data uh, generated daily by geospatial big data we specifically mean geo-enriched data that can be interrogated through geographic queries and supplemented with other contextual details to allow for an, an enhanced understanding of something of interest relevant to that location component. And this definition encompasses the analysis of data through geographic information systems, which then facilitates location intelligence. So in terms of an overview of location intelligence, um, which is sometimes referred to as spatial intelligence, it's the process of deriving insights and patterns from geospatial data in order to solve a specific problem, make decisions, improve business interaction. So it's essentially a consistent definition with big data analytics, but highlights more specifically the significance of the location or spatial aspect. What I think is interesting here and in line with the shifts that I uh, previously mentioned is the move from location intelligence being an activity performed by um, geographic information systems or other technical professionals to an activity that can be carried out or is achievable by members of the general public. And we're also seeing the convergence of location and geospatial data and corresponding applications and services with machine learning functionality resulting in geospatial artificial intelligence, often referred to as geo-AI. Um, on the next slide, in terms of um, what this does, I believe it further amplifies both the opportunities and the challenges shown here and also considerably complicates the way in which we engage with research and design and the way that we utilize the underlying systems. Importantly, in thinking about location intelligence and geospatial artificial intelligence, we must somehow concurrently recognize and factor in the opportunities and challenges in a way that is beneficial to a range of stakeholders. Some of those stakeholders I had identified earlier, including the users, the operational and non-operational industry stakeholders, government and so on. Some of the opportunities include the accurate uh, or accurate information and recommendations across a range of usability contexts, highly relevant and personalized recommendations and services. Um, the literature also notes enhanced profiling capabilities from a business or organizational perspective, but I believe the world profiling is problematic for a, a range of reasons. Um, but the literature does cite this in terms of a better understanding of customers leading to more targeted, personalised and convenient services. And there's also in terms of opportunities, uh, superior predictive capabilities as an opportunity whereby from an operations viewpoint, for example, organisations are better able to manage their operations, reduce certain risks within their context and engage in improved planning and decision making processes. Uh, these opportunities, however, cannot be considered in isolation, and this sort of draws on some of the work that I mentioned previously as part of our prior research, uh, as there are a range of challenges that must be explored and addressed, and they include uh, 
those that are socio-ethical and socio-technical in nature, some of which I highlighted earlier, as well as challenges associated with relevant regulatory provisions and governance frameworks, particularly in light of that artificial intelligence aspect. Uh, on the next slide, we have he illustrated, um, or I guess in, encompassed within this slide is an appreciation of the complexity that I mentioned. As you can see, we're actually working within multiple levels and this further contributes to the complexity and our analysis of opportunities and challenges and how we can best design these systems. For instance, we need to possess a nuanced understanding of big data analytics, followed by geospatial big data analytics, a subset of that in location intelligence and yet another subset in geospatial AI. And this is a challenge from a design and regulation perspective. But let's just spend a moment reviewing geospatial AI as a subset of these fields that we've introduced. So as a subset, it involves utilising real-time location and geospatial data in machine learning algorithms, as well as historical location data logs as training data in machine learning. Within the context of these systems, we could potentially uh, be utilizing a combination of big data files and multiple geospatial data files combined with other location data logs by supplementing those existing advanced location-based services with machine learning capabilities. Uh, so on the next slide, this becomes increasingly interesting when we view it within the frame of a geospatial AI revolution, where we track progress from the 1990s roughly, where spatial data was expensive, access was being made available via managed services, and the algorithmic application or application was quite limited. Uh, right through to desktop-based mapping mentioned earlier and the cloud-based systems respectively to that current age right on the right side of your screen uh, of technological convergence geospatial AI and computer vision systems and artificial intelligence and machine learning techniques. And with each of these phases within this revolution, there is an increase in autonomy represented by that arrow facilitated by additional data availability and data sets, enhanced processing capabilities and computational power and better cloud storage system in addition to a range of other um, uh, other concepts and, and other developments. And just to finish off before I hand over to Katina to go through some of the case studies, I just wanted to speak for a moment about uh, what the convergence of this technology means in light of our work, in light of the future of this particular area of geospatial AI and how we design these systems. And I think it's really important that we, to note that the convergence of technologies here is key as the merging of the computer vision systems, the geospatial information systems, geospatial AI, and AI in general machine learning more broadly has encouraged discussions to veer towards interdisciplinarity, recognizing geospatial AI as, and I quote here, an evolving and interdisciplinary field that bridges a range of scientific fields. So computer science, engineering, statistics, and spatial science, in addition to other fields beyond these scientific fields and disciplines. Um, so what this requires is some form of cross-disciplinarity, so cross-disciplinary approaches to develop and establish rigour as per the quote on your slide. And um, in our conclusion, and to finish up this discussion later on, we'll talk beyond cross-disciplinarity, multidisciplinarity and an interdisciplinary approach towards transdisciplinarity. But before we do that, I might hand over to Katina to speak about um, and talk to some of the case studies around present and future modes of operation. Katina? You are muted, Katina. How is that, everyone? Good? Okay, we can okay. hear you now. Wonderful. I'll share screen again. Thank you for that wonderful uh, discussion so far, Robo. Um, and now to introduce the case studies. We have three that will complement all the ground uh, that Robo covered. Uh, we begin with 
a present mode of operation, uh, a case study that was conducted in 2009. And here we explored advanced location-based services. Well, advanced at the time, that is. Uh, today we call them present mode of operation, although at the time uh, they were definitely advanced for the capabilities that were available. And here we looked at location and the position of a mobile device. Uh, we looked at contextual information and value-added services. And within a sort of a 3G network, um, particularly looking at the value chain, uh, the various uh, components that would have to come together to offer location-based services for push or pull specific value-added services. And, you know, this was everything from handset suppliers to content providers to network providers to storage providers all coming together. You know, sometimes we would count between nine and 14 different stakeholder types that would offer a location-based service. And so we relied on some of the early work here by George Giaglis, uh, Lopez, Shiod, uh, some of the work by Sarah Speakerman uh, and Axel Cooper of Germany, of course. So our first geospatial uh, foray was in scenarios where we decided we could harness the advanced location-based services within a socio-ethical scenario context. And literally, we looked at what could people do with your spatial data, as in your personal spatial data. And uh, we requested... Uh, volunteerism from uh, our student base with ethics approval for them to hand us uh, at different intervals their location data over a period of four weeks uh, dependent on the group that we were looking at. And so the process began by uh, conducting a spatial analysis, the initial manipulation to get the data off the devices. There were various devices that we used and then to ensure the personal privacy of the um, participants, we would obfuscate using various techniques. And then we would compute, and then we would get some out output. And these were the actual scenarios that were being depicted. On the right-hand side, you can see some of the obfuscation methods, deleting waypoints, for example, especially those that were taken every 30 seconds, sometimes every three seconds, depending on the type of tracker that was being used. We would randomize waypoints, discretize and subsample and mix and uh, that kind of obfuscation methodology uh, and suite of obfuscation techniques uh, was taken by brush et al from brush et al in 2010 where we decided we would ensure the privacy of uh, the individuals who participated but also looking at how that might work within a context of, of risk and so who would have that data uh, was it the property of the individual subscriber? Uh, did the telecommunications provider have access? Did anyone in the value chain have access? And what were, what were their responsibilities? So in obfuscating, uh, you can see that we would sometimes shift whole curves. Uh, we would sometimes uh, delete waypoints and simulate various scenarios that were based on literature. Much of it was based on case law, in fact. And so on the right-hand side, you can see some of those scenarios whereby we're looking at emergency management, for example, during fires or during floods or any kind of state of emergency that was declared through the Emergency Declaration Act of Australia or the state-based uh, emergency acts. Child protection was another one, looking at uh, movement uh, of individual and guardianship and so forth, uh, people who were responsible for picking up children and people who were not allowed to pick up children. Uh, sometimes through extended supervision orders and beyond. We would look at employer monitoring, the context of an employer being able to access the data. Spousal tracking uh, was one of the top selling uh, location-based services, in fact, uh, and device-centric services that we found available. Uh, lots of different suppliers in different states were selling different kinds of spousal tracking uh, devices. And we looked at the risk level associated with the potential to recover uh, information from different uh, devices and what could be done with those. And in some cases, uh, heinous crimes were committed, uh, not through spousal tracking, uh, but I would say uh, stranger tracking almost, and unauthorized tracking, as we just mentioned. And so looking at these risk levels from low to minor to catastrophic, you could see through this advanced location-based services, potentially how the data could be used uh, in a way to support someone's uh, sustainable uh, living or to actually 
uh, hamper it or injure it. And so moving to a future mode of operation, and of course, that present mode informed a lot of our feedback uh, to various levels of government, various levels of industry. Uh, Robert produced an outstanding public consultation report that was fed back into the community. And so they were able to provide us with uh, their response uh, once they received our user studies and what they actually uh, implied, uh, both for law uh, and also for organisations. When we shift now to a future mode, and of course, we're always moving towards a future mode, uh, you know, today versus 10 years ago, um, I'm speculating now about a future mode, but I can see seeds today uh, about what is possible. And when we talk about future modes, we talk about enhancements, uh, we talk about uh, additional power of something, uh, we talk about um, more of something, uh, a new business capability, a new architecture, evolutionary scenarios. And so while we, you know, 10 years ago, we're looking at triggering things like the distance between two points or buffers from a centroid uh, or uh, a tracking capability to look at movement between devices over time, or we would integrate that with the time of day data. We're now talking about something much more significant. And so this future mode of operation uh, with the new architectures and new infrastructure, of course, has proliferated as a result of the number of devices we have in the field, some of which are campus-based and some of which are open uh, in the public domain. And this is where we talk about localization techniques. Um, the very fact that most devices run on an IP-based IP infrastructure means within those packets, uh, there is a location stamp of some type. There is a originating point and a terminating point. And many people don't realize that inherently these IP-based uh, devices have a location. Same with cellular. Uh, you know, in, in, in my experience in a networking organization, uh, the cellular, of course, was there to ensure billing initially, but also service provisioning, where you're looking at issues to do with congestion uh, in terms of capacity or coverage, and looking at, you know, which one of those uh, constraints would help you model uh, a 2G or 3G or 4G network. But the whole idea of location being integral to any data that's being passed in these localization techniques is that it's not just location. There's also an identity that comes with that packet and condition can also be inferred. We know that if you're traveling between two location points, uh, you can look at speed, distance and time and the amazing um, values and equations that you can build between these speed, distance and time factors can infer condition, you know, whether I'm running quickly, I'm in a car, I'm in a bus, I'm in a train, um, but also with the additional sensors that come packed onto devices like our smartphones, we now also can measure things like pulse rates, uh, sweaty palms, temperature, uh, and a whole bunch of other things with the 14 or so different sensors in most smartphones today. And so we can infer things from these algorithms. And if we're looking at indoor positioning, we can be extracting this data from radio frequency identification, uh, UHF, near field communication, Bluetooth, low energy, wireless LANs, and even the power consumption to a socket. If we're looking at outdoor positioning, of course, we're looking more at global positioning systems or GNSS or assisted GPS, and then signal strength and the various types of techniques in order to measure distance and uh, propagation. Uh, but then there's this hybrid thing happening from the indoor campus to the outdoor campus and the movement and tracking and for anyone who's ever watched the film Enemy of the State, there's this famous scene of Will Smith in an elevator, and he doesn't know he's got all these embedded devices in his belt buckle and in his shoes and his phone and wherever else, and he's getting to the top. Gene Hackman says, you know, just take everything off. And so he throws his watch off, off the top of the tower, and uh, the, the CIA or whoever it was uh, in the state was saying he's either committed suicide because they could see the watch falling, but what ensues there is this chase between the in-building and they can see him going down the elevators, they can actually see him going between places and through a tunnel, through a train station and so forth. Reminds me of a story uh, of a, an incident where I was at a national security conference around 2006, talking to an intelligence officer who said to me, you know, Katina, all I want to do is create a capability that if I want to find someone on the Earth's surface, all I want to do is, and he just shows me this motion of typing in the person's identity and said, 
I want to hit and I want to know where they are. I said, that's great dreaming. Um, but the dreaming is is actually uh, not so far fetched these days, given the wireless coverage that we have. And increasingly with things like SpaceX, the 2000, 4000 in future and beyond satellites that we're going to see launched uh, covering every inch of the earth. The biggest breakthrough perhaps to mention here uh, are the things like Internet of Things devices. And I want to add in Internet of Things and people. Uh, it's not far fetched that uh, embedded devices will also be uh, in the last mile. And I call the last mile the human being uh, tethering to a smartphone with the GPS and additional brains. Uh, but the AI and ML fascinating here because we're talking about biometrics, not just biometrics of the face, but biometrics of anything really. Uh, extended by computer vision. And it's this computer vision capability that's allowing us to do a lot of interesting things. And this is just one case study from 2017, where a company that is working with SpaceX, an Adelaide-based Australian company, Miri Ota, uh, with a New Zealand company, I Measure You, uh, have created something called the Fight Recorder. And this is now where we're seeing devices in tandem, okay, on the network side work together, satellites and these uh, clunky uh, units which offer precise location, in this instance, of injured soldiers. And I want you to start thinking about the black box recorder in a plane, and we know we have them in vehicles, but now we're talking about black boxes on humans. And it's a fascinating way to consider, you know, if I want to do what that intelligence analyst was once telling me and type in an injured soldier in the field, you know, somebody who's not moving, an exception report comes back, I want to be able to see what's going on. Well, I could look at that tiny black box recorder in the individual. And, and here we start to look at the data collection aspect where we've done things like, and, and this is very well known in the literature, there are two sort of main approaches to environmental scanning or data collection. The first is the fixed. You know, we've traditionally had CCTV cameras on a, on a pole. Uh, we've had traffic lights. We've had entry, exit, gantry points at public transit or highways. Um, uh, or trying to monitor congestion uh, through different highways, for example, in Singapore. And we've also now increasingly seen the onset of AI in mobile objects and subjects. So a person with a smartphone that has a token by extension, an IP-based camera in a vehicle that's moving, a drone that's human operated but is flying overhead, and finally two autonomous robots. So in the past, we required either a fixed location, but today in this future mode, there are all of these mobile objects and some of them can be moved and positioned in a fixed state or they can continually be combing the landscape around us. And so the vehicles uh, are extremely powerful uh, and that will inform one of our case studies to come. And then the drones and vehicles in tandem and then the autonomous robot, almost this automatic data collection device uh, way beyond what we've seen with a street view uh, or, or the different kinds of uh, Google uh, data collection devices taking photographs of our open space. But together, the fixed and mobile are incredibly powerful. And so here I, I will take you to a, a case study, uh, a great company in Western Australia called Aero Ranger that's really pushing the boundaries of what we would call a future mode of operation, although they exist today and they're operating in this state. I look forward to seeing how they will grow their business. It's about capturing, managing, and analyzing billions of vehicles in one workspace. And they deal with vehicles and vehicular hits at the moment, not so much facial recognition. In fact, to my knowledge, they're not doing facial recognition, like, for example, Clearview AI uh, is. But if I go to a particular uh, video here, and I hope you can hear it, uh, let's see what, what they might introduce us to. Hi, I'm John, and this is Sam. And in this video, we're going to show you the new addition to the AeroRanger family, the Edge AI module. Let's go and check out what it can do. This is the Edge AI module. It enables you to connect any IP camera and upgrade its functionality to a fully integrated AI traffic analysis platform. This is the backbone of our ALPR solutions. OK, so let's install the Edge AI module into a vehicle. Simply plug the power into a cigarette lighter or you can wire it in permanently if you wish. And then suction cut the cameras onto the windscreen. 
turn the car on and you're good to go. The Edge AI module, along with the dash mounted cameras, make up the Chariot ALPR system. This will automatically boot up, initialize the cameras, connect to the Air Ranger database via the integrated 4G connection, and fix a GPS location. Once you are driving, the cameras will scan for all vehicles within the camera vision, categorize the vehicle by make, model, color, type, and age, as well as recognize the plate number and the country or state that it was registered in. Checkpoint ALPR works in exactly the same way. Simply connect the CCTV camera, turn it on, and start monitoring and collecting data at the intersection of your choice. In this example, we're using a mobile tripod unit, but with its IP67 capability, the Edge AI module can be permanently installed at a roadside for 24 seven vehicle data collection. And with its included capture link application, the camera can be monitored from anywhere in the world. So there we have it, a simple way of collecting traffic information that's fully integrated with AeroRanger and is available today. Find out more at so we can see from that example, um, the invasiveness perhaps uh, of the system. Um, and what I want to do now is actually screen share uh, to Aero Rangers website. And let me try and do that uh, successfully. I, I hope I can. Um, let me screen share. And what I'm going to do is go to the back end of uh, Aero Rangers website. Uh, let's see if it'll let me. Interesting. Um, it may not, folks. So let me just see. Can anyone see the front screen of Welcome to Aero Ranger there? Yes or no? So I'm going to log in. Uh, and I hope you can see Aero Ranger's back end there uh, for the demo. And I'm going to enable the demo mode here. And it's going to show me uh, pretty much. Uh, how many vehicles uh, in its network have been viewed overnight uh, in the last 24 hours. Uh, note, my uh, machine is in Arizona time, time zone, so you might see some disparity here. But about at its peak, 3,000 vehicles at around uh, 1 p.m. Were, not were noted during the rush hour at lunchtime and then overnight the 12 a.m. Uh, trough. And what you can see here are busy uh, cycles, busy hours, uh, busy periods of time in traffic uh, spots. Um, but if I wanted to do a plate search here, um, and here's a map of the world, I can look at the last 24 hours and it's telling me with these two cameras here in northern New South Wales and southern Western Australia, uh, I can see the make and model, which wasn't the model wasn't detected here, but I, I can see what's called the license plate. Americans say ALPR, uh, the British and Australians call it ANPR, the automatic number plate recognition. So what it's done is a camera has gone and uh, taken a photograph and has uh, taken that using uh, machine learning and uh, here purely OCR and fed it back into the system. And so if I want to look at where this vehicle was sighted on a map, I can zoom into that location. And I can also bring up hit details. And so this individual may have been just minding their own business down Bogabilla Road uh, in northern New South Wales. Uh, but if I wanted to look at it more in detail here, I can see a whole suite of things. Uh, and for, for most people, and here's the, the zoomed in image, for most people, this would be rather alarming uh, in the general public. Uh, they would probably say that uh, they would prefer to go undetected. Uh, you know, they haven't broken any rules, uh, but uh, this capability uh, does exist. And there may be some good reason for it to exist. Uh, so I'll go back to the PowerPoint now. I just that was a, a bit of a bird's eye view there. Um, and ensure we move on. But uh, some of the applications here uh, would be uh, quite diverse uh, within the policing realm as well, uh, but also potentially any one of those five major scenarios that Roba uh, investigated in her PhD and beyond her studies, uh, looking at the different levels of risk. And so this is the things that we have to really think about. What does this mean uh, in terms of risk and in terms of uh, responsibility, uh, in terms of innovation? Uh, what I didn't show you in the demo uh, was the fact that authorized vehicles and unauthorized and then uncategorized vehicles could come up. Uh, additionally, looking at vehicle makes, you know, if anyone wanted to really know that, but how long will it be before we start looking at 
what is inside the vehicle and who is inside the vehicle and who's driving, uh, which will be very interesting. Although I must state again, Aero Ranger just looks at vehicular traffic. But you can do this on a global level. You can log in. Uh, you can look at um, you know various types of things. Uh, in this case, perhaps uh, the address where people have been quarantining, uh, and in the future, perhaps other things depending on pandemic outbreaks. So here's another video uh, from Aero Ranger. This one on point and tap. To capture AOPR by Aero Ranger. This is a simple phone application that allows you to analyze any vehicle simply by taking a picture of it. You can glean information such as car make, model, color, age, and also the plate as well. It also can cross reference against a hot list if you have one of those and alert you if there's any issues. So let's go and capture some cars now and see what we can find. Capture AOPR has been designed to be as easy to use as a phone camera. Simply tap the shutter button to check the status of any car. And so this is where we're foot driving. If you start to look at uh, when people sniff for MAC addresses, for example, in this case, we're foot driving. Somebody's taking their mobile handset, taking a photograph, it's comparing it to another data set, and it's saying whether they've stayed too long in the same traffic spot, uh, they're in an authorized vehicle, they shouldn't be there, or they belong to the council business right next door and they're allowed to park there. But this is, I guess, the combination of smartphone, location technology, uh, AI and cloud data storage all coming together. And so is it really just location intelligence or are we now seeing this mass convergence, which uh, Robo referred to as geospatial AI? Um, but it's foot driving. Um, in this instance, again, you know, you can go down, download your app store. You can try this out within 24 hours if you wanted to uh, and link it back to the dashboard that I showed you in that real time demo. But find a vehicle in a haystack. So we, we moved away from the uh, big data set that was trying to uncover insights, patterns and trends. And now we have this newfound capability where we're starting to look at finding instances of events or things or people. Uh, and again, Aero Ranger doesn't look at people, but what we're looking at here is the, the, the vehicle that's illegally camped, uh, vehicles that have been stolen, homeless occupants. Look at this suite of applications, uh, repossession and so forth. Um, and it's saying, you know, it's like Google Analytics, but for real traffic. And so we're starting to look at this search capability that will occur uh, in various ways. Perhaps Clearview AI is that search that Google search for the face, as has been said by the CEO many times on interviews, for example, the latest one on PBS versus this one from Aero Ranger to be vehicular. Do you need more data? Are you using a mobile? Are you using a drone, a CCTV or a vehicle? And all of these various form factors. And here's one with a drone. So you can see here this kind of strange semi-autonomous human operated pinged, even though we saw those two uh, foot officers in the field of view, it was the drone that detected uh, that car that was over 32 minutes in its parking. So this crazy space of semi-autonomy, human operated, human in the loop, uh, but doing this drones aerial photography matching back and then locating the vehicle, like identifying the vehicle and probably penalizing its driver. Case study three looks at full autonomy. And uh, this is a very old sort of Dalek style device. Uh, for those of you who do watch Doctor Who, the K5 night scope since around, uh, you know, the mid 2000s uh, ish uh, has, I would say 2008, nine actually has reminded me uh, of the Daleks. And this is a fully autonomous outdoor security robot that has those sensors that are jam-packed on our smartphones, but in its body. Uh, and it has four cameras. I'll just go straight to the video 
uh, in the consciousness of time. Microsoft, Samsung, a lot of these big companies use it, uh, but we don't as yet know if it's gimmicky or is it actually doing what it's supposed to be doing. But have a look at this one down New York uh, Parade. So the implications of the geospatial AI, if we look at this from uh, human collected data to more autonomous collected data, and then the AI smarts in the background that have converged uh, with the machine learning capabilities and the ability to cluster and to predict uh, and even categorize land use, uh, what we're seeing is a new visibility we call ubervalence. This is the coming together of identity, location, and condition uh, using mechanisms of tagging, tracking, or tracing for control, care, or convenience. But what are the public risks associated with this new visibility? And how do we manage the fact that we are living in this new visibility? We can look at the duality of technology, the geosurveillance for control. And here on the left-hand side, again, another Aero Ranger panel looking at hazardous waste, for example, and identifying that through various mechanisms and then geosurveillance for care, for instance, in the agricultural space or energy space. But the risks associated with ubervalence are three main ones we've categorized in the literature. Misinformation, misinterpretation of data, and information manipulation. It's false or inaccurate information. It's action of interpreting something wrongly and saying, well, that's what it is. And the action of manipulating information in an unscrupulous way, almost deliberately. And this is about using inferences as de facto evidence, and you can get yourself in trouble with that. Interestingly, uh, somebody from Aero Ranger was uh, interviewed about a year ago and stated, unfortunately, this is one of the founders himself, unfortunately, the rules on data and privacy haven't really kept up with all of this technology, so it's a concern. And so they're aware of it, laws lagging behind technology. That's called the pacing problem. But we look at this from the potentiality of what can we do, what's achievable uh, for care of the environment, for example, what's possible? And looking at this notion of a planetary skin that was created by NASA, Cisco, and a myriad of other organizations back in 2009-10, which talked about the ability to sense the Earth for sustainability, to, to look at the Earth, to understand the Earth better. And so while these amazing kinds of uh, case studies we've shown you uh, are, are looking at events or areas, the question is whether they can scale and at what cost? And is that what we want? Do we want to live in that kind of future? But data quality trumps everything, uh, the older day age, garbage in, garbage out, but also how do we process the data that we have collected? That's one of the biggest bottlenecks we feel in the field. But here, just for a moment, uh, before we conclude, just to look at the potential is really important. We can't negate the fact that we are developing these new technologies for good in the public interest. And here's just a summary uh, from Aero Ranger again. Thank <laughs> you. 
So for any of us who have worked in the GIST space uh, for any length of time, we know the complexity that goes behind, behind uh, offering images like this in real time. Uh, and I will constantly go back, no matter how snazzy we get with our capabilities, we always have to go back to those risk matrices that Robert invested time in, uh, in stakeholder consultation. And that's where I think I'll hand over to her. Thank you, Katina. Uh I think we'll probably end off by having a, a brief discussion and overview of where to from here. So how do we look within the context of what Katina mentioned in terms of opportunities and challenges to capitalise on those opportunities, but also minimise the risks associated with some of the challenges that have been identified. In particular, we're looking towards design. So what are the design implications, particularly from our perspective and the perspective of our research team? And in general, what are the design recommendations? What are the design requirements that allow us to work toward the human health and well-being, the public interest and environmental sustainability? And while we don't have all the answers, we do have, based on our research, some requirements or some, uh, I guess, elements or pointing in the to point to that particular vision for the future. The first, I think, is uh, the middle ground, as we've called it. So being able to find that middle ground between those opportunities and, and challenges in it to temper some of those um, uh, opportunities and technological potential with the challenges and risks that are, uh, that are emerging. There's also this notion of working within the context of both present and future modes of operation, as we've termed them here. And we do recognise that there is this simultaneous um, or simultaneous in parallel development cycles that are going on, some of which are geared towards that geospatial AI vision and others are our advanced location-based services. And we need to be able to concurrently account for both of those in our designs, in our socio-ethical implications uh, and uh, analysis and so on. Um, there's also the need to reevaluate and reconceptualize our notion of stakeholders across or shifting from those present modes of operation through to the future modes of operation. So beyond the traditional, as we call the mobile commerce value chains that exist within the context of advanced location-based services to those that are much larger and much more complex when we get uh, to, or when we, uh, I guess, encounter the geospatial AI context. Something that's quite key and that we're working on at the moment is stakeholder inclusivity. So stakeholder inclusivity as it applies to embedding the uh, interests of consumers, business and government stakeholders and reconciling those interests in a theoretically and methodologically grounded fashion with the intention of working towards transdisciplinarity. So not interdisciplinary, cross-disciplinary or multidisciplinary approaches, but rather the multi-sector, multinational uh, and um, transdisciplinary approaches that result in new forms of knowledge production to allow us to tackle some of these challenges, but also capitalise on the potential that these technologies promise and in closing I think it's really important for us to think again beyond that technological and computational perspective to account for the social the regulatory in addition to the technical aspects associated with geospatial big data analytics and geospatial uh, artificial intelligence thank you Well, thank you very much. Uh, perfectly right on time as well. So uh, appreciate that. Um, thank you to all our speakers. I think we can plan clapping for them on, uh, down below. Uh, we are just out of time. And as I mentioned at the beginning, we're actually going to leave the questions until the, uh, the table or breakout session. So thank you again to our speakers. Uh, if you do have questions for the speakers, I think Katina's sitting, sitting around. 
Um, you're welcome to join table one when the session ends. Uh, so join table one and we'll, we'll have the opportunity to have some questions. I know I'm going to join and ask some questions as well. Uh, other than that, we have a 15 minute break now. So we'll be back in 15 minutes for the next uh, paper session after that. Thank you again to our speakers.